Hey, welcome this morning. Glad that you're here. And if you're watching online, thanks for continuing this conversation. In this particular series, Windows of Easter, we're looking at perspectives from the men and women that were closest to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. In week one, we looked through the window of surprise, talked about Malchus, who had his right ear removed because of Peter's sword and decision to cut it off, and Jesus restored his ear. Week two, we looked through Judas Iscariot's eyes and talked about the window of sin and talked about what may have been going on in his mind as he betrayed Jesus. Last week, we looked at the window of significance and talked about the centurion soldier who was responsible for the execution and crucifixion of Jesus. It was significant in his confession specifically when he proclaimed that Jesus truly was the Son of God. Today we look through the window of sorrow. Sorrow, grief is a very difficult thing sometimes to move through. And there may be no greater grief than when we lose a loved one who was extremely close to us. Now grief is very individualistic. There's no right way or wrong way. There's no one size fits all when it comes to grief either. Some people grieve very outwardly and some grieve very inwardly. And so it is very individualistically specific. Every loss that we have is colored by its own unique sorrow. And as challenging as it may be to live alone by ourselves, it's even more challenging if we've lost someone that we've spent 20, 30, 40, 60, 70 years together in intimate fellowship with one another, and they pass from this life to the next. That can be very difficult to to move through. Grief can also be exacerbated by a heart of regret. Now, we could look through the lens of any one of Jesus' friends. Um, They all experienced this window of sorrow um, at his passing when Jesus died. But we're going to look through the eyes of a man, Joseph of Arimathea, who not only experienced sorrow, but his sorrow was kind of painted through a lens of regret as well. And so his life provides a very unique portrait for us because... Most of us, if not all of us, not have we only experienced sorrow, but we probably have some regret in our lives as well. So we look through the filter of his life, Joseph of Arimathea. Now, there's some things we need to know about Joseph. First of all, Joseph of Arimathea was a man of means. Now, we re-enter the passion of Christ. Christ has died. He has given up his spirit. He is still, his body is still on the cross. And time is running out. Now in Judaism, with all the religious Jewish principles and practices and laws, they had a lot of do's and don'ts when it came to caring for a dead body. In fact, they are right in the midst of Passover time, and no one would have really wanted to touch a dead body because they would have been unclean and would not have been able to finish eating the Passover because of their unclean state. And 6 p.m. is when the Sabbath begins, and so they have to take care of Jesus' body before 6 p.m. hits and the Sabbath begins. Joseph, though, was a man of wealth. Listen to Matthew 27, verse 57. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Now, as with most Josephs in the Bible, this particular Joseph had integrity. He had good character. He was upright. He comes from a town of Arimathea. Now, that doesn't really help us all that much because there were several um, towns called Arimathea in the Palestine area, but most likely because that word means heights, most likely he came from the same area that Samuel came from, from the Mount Ephraim area. Now, no matter what culture you're from, rich means rich. And so Matthew, who's writing this, who was a former tax collector, he knows a little something about money, and he says that Joseph of Arimathea was rich, and so he could afford some you know, establishments, and I refer to as McDavid's this morning, and Emily, after first service, she goes, Dad, we didn't get the joke about McDavid. 
uh, what were you talking about? I'm like, he's Jewish. It's not McDonald's. It's McDavid. She goes, oh, okay, I get it. But you may need to explain it. <laughs> so if I say he could afford some McDavid's, that's why. First century, okay? So he had, he had money. He had means. Joseph's request was an event, and he requested the body, and we're going to read about him going to Pilate and requesting Jesus' body. This request of Joseph would have sent shockwaves through first century Jerusalem. Why? It's because the religious leaders and everyone at that time thought that Jesus' followers were poor, that they were backward Galileans. Well, Joseph of Arimathea, first of all, he's not backwards. Second of all, he's not a Galilean. He's from Arimathea. And third, he is not poor. He has means. He is rich. And so he shatters the demographics of who a Jesus follower could potentially be. The fact of the matter is there's Jesus followers who were poor, but there were also Jesus followers who were rich. Listen to Luke chapter 23. Now, there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, that is the Sanhedrin, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Now, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council that had condemned Jesus to die, but he didn't have any part of that. He didn't ascribe to their way of thinking. But he was a member, if there was a Jerusalem hall of power, his wealth would have made him a part of that group. However, because he took his stand with Jesus against the Sanhedrin, all his valued wealth that had carried so much clout, that had carried so much influence, if he had any aspirations of going further in the halls of power, it was over. And it seems like now his wealth is only good for carrying for the crucified Christ. He was a man of means. He was wealthy. He was rich. The second thing that we need to know about Joseph of Arimathea is that he was a man of fear. He was a man of fear. Now, when we allow fear to become the driving force behind our choices, the consequences in our life can be devastating. Now, if every one of us in this room or everyone who's watching online, if we were honest with ourselves, we could come up with a time in our lives when we allowed fear to have its way with us and we got into all sorts of messes because of that fear. But I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask for volunteers to stand up here and give testimonies. We can look at the men and women of the Bible and there's plenty of evidence there. Take a look at Adam. Adam, because of his fear, he and Eve ran off to hide from God in the garden. Then there's Sarah. Sarah, because of her fear, she lied and laughed at God. Then there's Elijah. He allowed his fear to make him run, and he's hiding out in a cave somewhere. And then there's the blind man's parents, the ones that Jesus had healed the blind man, and they had so much fear of the religious leaders, they couldn't even celebrate the fact that their son who from blind from birth had been healed by Jesus because they didn't want to enrage the religious leaders. They didn't want to be thrown out of the synagogue. And then there's Pilate. Pilate, because of his fear, can't stand up on his own decision that this man did not deserve to die, that he was the truth, that he was blameless, and yet because of fear, maybe it's because of the people going to Rome and talking to Caesar, and he doesn't want to get into trouble anymore for the things that he had previously done. He just capitulates and allows the crowd to take Jesus, and he's crucified. Fear is can become a force that enslaves our hearts. And the results can oftentimes be the pain of regret, leaving us with questions, the what ifs. What could I have done? What should I have done? What ought to I have done? What did I do that I shouldn't have done? What didn't I do that I should have done? And we have all these questions and they second guess our shortcomings is what happens. And Joseph was a man who had regrets. He had fear. Listen to John chapter 19. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. Secretly. He was a secret 
admirer. Now, when we were in elementary school, having a secret admirer, man, that was big. That was a big deal. We liked having a secret admirer. But as we become an adult, we realize that secret admirers lack courage. And Joseph of Arimathea, he was a secret admirer of Jesus. He was a private Jesus follower. He wasn't a public Jesus follower. Why? It's because he feared men. He feared the other religious leaders. He feared being, feared being persecuted. He feared possibility of being a martyr. And he wasn't ready to go public with his faith. Joseph had the regret of knowing that his life was less than it should have been had he sided and walked with Jesus publicly. Joseph had the fear of others, so he chose the contradictory path of secret discipleship. Now, before we condemn him, we need to understand that we all have things that we're afraid of. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid that you're going to lose your job if your boss finds out that you're a Christian because he's been asking you to do things for years and you've just been doing them that lack integrity because you don't want him to find out that you're a Christian because if he finds out and you draw the line that you're not going to do that anymore, you're going to lose your job, you're going to lose your pension, you're going to lose your retirement. Or how about your teacher who's not a Christian, who's always berating the church, berating Christians. You've got to write a paper, and you want to take a stand for Christ in that paper, but you know you're going to get an F on that paper if you stand up for Christ. So you're just going to be a private, secret admirer of Jesus. What are you afraid of? You see... Maybe you're afraid to tell your friend to stop taking God's name in vain because they'll stop being your friend. We all have these fears. But the Bible over and over and over again tells us encouraging words regarding how to deal with fear and what not to allow that to, to enter our hearts. Listen to 2 Timothy 1, 7. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us Power, love, and self-discipline. Man, I don't like to be timid, especially when I'm talking about Jesus. I mean, that is, that is one word that it better not come any in, in, in my presence, in my heart at all when we're talking about Jesus. Timid? No way. Courage, love, self-discipline, boldness, you know, uh, faithfulness. That's who we're supposed to be. Then there's Hebrews 13, 6. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? That's a great question. What can mere mortals do to you when the Lord is your helper? Then there's the Tom Hanks verse of the Bible, 1 John 4, 18. There's no fear in love. There's no crying in baseball. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Over and over and over again, Jesus says this, do not be afraid. Do not worry. Do not have anxiety. Do not be anxious. Do not be a scaredy cat. That's found in 3 Timothy, the Tedrick translation. <laughs> the paralyzing nature of fear will destroy us if we allow it in. We have to surrender our fears to the perfect love of the one who can cast out those fears so that we don't have any regrets. Driven by fear rather than faith, Joseph had succumbed to this fear of men, to the worry of what they could do. And this fear had led him to choose the safety of secret discipleship. He was afraid. But could he come back? Could he recover? Is this the unpardonable sin? If I'm a secret admirer of Jesus, if I'm a secret disciple... Can I come back from that? The answer is yes, because Joseph of Arimathea came back from that. It's not the unpardonable sin. He actually demonstrated this courage that he should have demonstrated earlier during the trials of Jesus. He didn't agree with the other religious leaders that Jesus needed to be put to death. He tried to do everything that he could to stop it, he and Nicodemus both, but to no avail. But he took his stand. Luke chapter 23. Now, there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. This man of fear gathered up the courage, and he confronted Pilate. 
despite his own involvement in the council that ruled in favor of condemning Jesus, he took his stand. And being a, an associate of Jesus, Pilate could have had him thrown in jail. Pilate could have had him crucified. But it didn't matter. He took his stand. He wasn't timid anymore. He wasn't a secret admirer anymore. Yes, Joseph was a man of means. Yes, Joseph was a man of fear, but Joseph was also a man who cared. Why take the risk? Why take the risk to take care of a dead body? Jesus isn't there. His spirit left his body. I mean, he's not there. So why why take care of, of, of of a dead body? Why mess up your Passover meal? I mean, the family's all gathered. It's like after Easter, you know, and family's all together, you know, and somebody wants to be baptized on Easter Sunday, it's like, oh, man, I'm going to be late for the ham and potatoes. (laughs) Because there's something noble. There's something respectable. There's something honorable in showing care for those who have left this life and gone to the next. In the midst of a harsh world that is so often, they don't care. In a world that so often doesn't care. Joseph, who had previously been afraid to publicly identify with Christ during his, during his life, now he does the unthinkable. He does the unfathomable. He identifies with Jesus in his death. John chapter 19 Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Whose tomb was it? It was Joseph's tomb. It was was his last gift. Now listen, taking the body off the cross, think about how gruesome that was. Think about, that's not an easy task. I mean, blood's everywhere. I mean, they, they've, now they've touched a dead body. Now they can't celebrate the Passover with, with their family. It's just a gruesome task. And yet he wanted to demonstrate his love and his care in this last moment of being able to do something for the Christ. And the Christ whose death had caused the veil of the temple that separated the Holy of Holies that tore from the top to the bottom, representing the fact that God did that, not man, who would have ripped it from the bottom to the top. But it's torn from the top to the bottom, allowing all of us access to God because we are the priesthood of all believers. We all have access to communicate with God. Now they are taking small strips of linen and they're wrapping Jesus' body, preparing it for death. And these two men... Joseph and Nicodemus, they had this intimate relationship with each other and with Christ that they loved Jesus so much they wanted to do this one last thing for him. It was too late for regret. But it wasn't too late to care. Now, what happens to Joseph of Arimathea? The Bible doesn't tell us. Man, there's more frustrating questions. And so because the Bible doesn't tell us, we've, we've got to go into church history. We've got to go into church tradition. We've got to go somewhere else to find out what happens. And there's a story that's told about Joseph of Arimathea that he actually goes to ancient England, sent there in A.D. 63 from Philip, sends him and his family and his friends to Britain to establish the first Christian community there called Glastonbury. Man, I I hope that that story is true, that Joseph of Arimathea uses his wealth to become a missionary to another place in another area. You see, if the story is true, Joseph of Arimathea's public display of devotion for Christ wasn't limited with just giving his carved out of the rock tomb and the burial procedures for Jesus. 
If it's true, Joseph overcame his fear. That means his sorrow may have dissipated as he reached a new land with the message of the once buried Jesus, but now raised from the dead Savior. If the story's true, that means Joseph's regrets were replaced with an active commitment that advanced the gospel message. If the story's true, that means that Joseph's failure as a disciple was replaced by his perseverance as a missionary. If the story's true, sorrow gave way to the joy of telling other people about Jesus. You have a choice in your life. You can choose to be defined by your fears. You can choose to be defined by your regrets. Joseph of Arimathea said, no, I'm not going to be defined by those things. He was refined by the love of Christ. You can be refined by the love of Christ as well. You don't have to let regrets and fear have its way with you. Look at what's happened in the past in your life. Why would you want to live the rest of your life that way? What can mere mortals do to you when God's your helper? (laughs) Okay, they can kill this body, but they certainly can't take my soul. That's the point. Who do you want to become? For Jesus, who do you want to become? Next week, we celebrate Easter. You know what? Every day, we should be celebrating Easter. Every day is Resurrection Day because our Jesus is alive. So who do you want to become? Who do you want to become for him? Do you want to be all wrapped up in your fears and your failures? Or do you want to be wrapped up in your successes and your advancements and how wonderful you are? No. On both sides of that. We want to be wrapped up in the fact that Jesus came out of that grave. We want to be wrapped up in the fact that Jesus is alive and well and can transform our fears and our failures and our successes and all of our regrets and all the things that make us feel special like our 848 FICO score. Woo! I'm somebody. He can take all that junk, and it's all junk, and he can allow us to have a heart for him that is no longer a secret admirer, but someone who doesn't have a spirit of timidity, someone who's nervous about taking a stand for Jesus, but people of power and passion for Jesus, because Jesus is worthy of our passion, amen? He's worthy of our courage, amen? He's worthy of our sold-out love, not secret discipleship, not our private, you know, as long as my family. Hey, listen, it's easy to be a Christian in this environment. If you're at home watching, it's easy to be a Christian probably in your home. But hey, I'm talking about public discipleship. I'm talking about leaving here and letting people know that you're a Christian. That's not so easy in our world today. And I'm not talking about making a stand on Facebook Oh, come on. You know, you can fire those missiles over that bow all you want. That's not the same thing either. I'm talking about at school taking a stand for Jesus. I'm talking about your workplace taking a stand for Jesus. Maybe it is your family that you need to take a stand for Jesus. I'm talking, and I'm not saying you had to be nasty about it. That's not what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to share in love. But secret ambition, secret admirership, secret discipleship for the one who died on the cross and was buried and came back from the dead? Is he, is he just that much of a person that's worthy of just that little from us? No way. He's worthy of all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our hope. Do you realize if you're a Christian... All of your hope is wrapped up in Jesus. We've all buried loved ones. You want to see them again? Jesus better be telling the truth or you won't. But Jesus is a truth teller. And so there is a reunion that's coming. And not only with your loved ones, but Jesus himself. Can you imagine what that... Man, I got spirit bumps. Man, you can probably see him right there, Paul, can't you? When we look at him face to face, man... What what a glory that's going to be.